Welcome to GCA's Masterclass on Climate Resilient Public-Private Partnerships. My name is Jay So, and I'm the Director of Programs at the Global Center on Adaptation. I'm connecting live from our floating office in Rotterdam. Allow me to set the scene for why, why you're here. Last month, the IPCC Special Report presented a stark warning on our climate future. Human activities have already caused approximately one degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels and reach 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2052 if it continues to increase at the current rate. Last Monday, September 6th, the GCA brought together over 50 global leaders at our headquarters in Rotterdam with the specific goal of raising the ambition on climate adaptation. Infrastructure featured at the center of the agenda. The WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iwala emphasized the need to mobilize the private sector to make global supply chains resilient. The president of African Development Bank, Adesina, highlighted the need to tap into new finance by engaging with industry sponsors and asset managers to integrate resilient infrastructure into their portfolios. The heads of EBRD, EIB, and OECD also highlighted the work that we're doing to get today on climate resilient PPPs. The mandate for all of us is clear. Adapting to climate change is no longer an option, it is on the critical path. As infrastructure PPP practitioners, all of you know how vital infrastructure systems are in driving the global economy and in helping people access markets and basic services such as healthcare. Climate change puts all of these services at risk. Globally, there's a huge infrastructure investment deficit that will require investments of more than $15 trillion investment gap by 2040. The private sector has to play a role in bridging this cap. Yet, while there's a strong body of knowledge on guidance for PPPs and literature on climate risks and resilience in infrastructures, countries lack the information on how to bring these two fields together. I would like to take a moment to thank GCA's host government in the Netherlands and share with you a message from Kees van der Verg, Director General of Mobility and Transport from the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management of the Netherlands. Hi, I'm Kees van der Berg. I'm Director General for Mobility and Transport of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management of the Netherlands. Good that you are participating this masterclass. The knowledge module on public-private partnership 
for climate resilient infrastructure. Climate change is one of the major challenges of our time. You know that. Not only do we need to limit the greenhouse effects, we also need to respond to the impacts of climate change. Earlier this year, during the Climate Edition Summit, we launched the Adaption Action Agenda with clear commitments to make our world more resilient to the effects of climate change in the coming decade. Focusing on water safety and resilient infrastructure. But despite, despite the fact that we addressed climate risk for infrastructure, still many countries have not yet incorporated resilience into their public-private uh, public framework, frameworks. Who will execute actions? Who will pay? And that's what this masterclass is all about. A five-day program packed with knowledge, with expertise and strategic sessions, how to set up the right partnerships. And it's up to you, it's up to you to become leaders in integrating climate adaptation and resilient to infrastructure partnerships as coming climate resilient infrastructure officers. I wish you a very, very inspiring masterclass. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Case. I'm also very pleased to be joined today by Imad Fakouri, Global Director for Infrastructure Finance and PPPs at the World Bank. Imad leads the World Bank Group's engagement on climate resilient PPPs and has been a critical and important partner for GCA in launching this program. Imad, over to you. Thank you, uh, Jay. Uh, partners and colleagues uh, from GCA and the various development agencies, our colleagues in the Dutch government, climate adaptation champions and soon to be certified climate resilience infrastructure officers participating in the program. Greetings to all of you. It is truly a pleasure to be with you all uh, today to launch the Climate Resilient Infrastructure Officer Training Program. The World Bank joins this international community in its concerns not only for holding down emissions to a sustainable level, but also for addressing the consequences of climate change that is here and now. I'm referring to strengthening the ability of communities, systems and economies to adapt to climate change. The World Bank Group's Climate Change Action Plan has set out an ambitious target for a 35% of our total financing to have climate co-benefits over the next five years. Importantly, this commitment seeks for 50% of this financing to support adaptation and resilience. The lack of resilient infrastructure harms people and economies. Our estimates is that infrastructure damage and disruption of services is costing developing economies around 390 to nearly $650 billion a year. Communities, businesses, and economies bear sizable direct losses, coping costs, and indirect impacts of poorly resilient infrastructure. There are practical decisions we can take to ensure the resilience of infrastructure services and that infrastructure strengthens resilience of communities. For example, building in redundancy, working with natural systems, or planning integrative networks. My department, through the Public-Private Infrastructure Advisory Facility, or PF, a global facility that is dedicated to building institutions in developing countries that set the stage for private participation in infrastructure and enabling finance for subnational entities, have been willing and active partners in the development of this Climate Resilient Infrastructure Officer Training Program. This is because of our conviction that infrastructure is central to resilience. Infrastructure can improve the adaptive capabilities of societies but can also increase vulnerabilities if ill-conceived, operated, and managed. A fundamental and no regrets action we can all take is to increase resiliency, which in fact, to get the basics right, 
to properly plan, maintain, and operate infrastructure services, and to invest in people like yourselves who prioritize, shape, and finance infrastructure development in your respective countries. Although the basics are not sufficient, we have seen a huge gap in the market for clarity on what it means in practical terms to integrate climate resilience throughout the project development cycle, and particularly for PPPs. If you work on PPPs, you will know that these are long-term agreements, and it is important that government contracting authorities are able to specify for the infrastructure requirements that will allow better anticipation of shocks, maintain a level of functionality in the face of shocks, and can, and can bounce back after them. This is why we are an investor in the global training program and in each of your capacities. Besides making this training program accessible to developing country clients of the World Bank, we are also pleased to be working in partnership with GCA to reinforce country systems, policies, and regulation that will incentivize better resilient infrastructure, including those that are financed and developed through public-private partnerships. We are truly inspired by your participation here today, and we look forward to taking this learning journey with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imad. We definitely could not have done this without the partnership of you and your team. With that, it gives me great pleasure to officially launch the Masterclass on Climate Resilient Infrastructure, PPPs. To explain the next portion of the program, I'd like to introduce Danilo Cansedo, who is GCA's program officer. Over to you, Danilo. Thank you, Jay, for this kind of introduction, and also thank Mad and Keys for officially launching GCA's Masterclass on Climate Resilient Public-Private Partnerships. This Masterclass is part of GCA's Knowledge Module on PPPs for Climate Resilient Infrastructure, which also includes a Climate Resilient Infrastructure Officer Handbook, a self-paced online course, and a certification exam by APMG. Building capacity of global PPP practitioners to integrate climate resilience into infrastructure is an important step, but just the starting point of working with the public and private sector to drive investments on the ground. The first cohort of the masterclass has 46 global PPP practitioners connecting from 28 different countries. We have asked these participants to record a message on why this masterclass is important and what are the key challenges that need to be overcome to ensure that PPP projects are climate resilient. Join me in watching this video. I believe we play a crucial role to pivot towards a more climate resilient infrastructure development in low and in middle income countries. I believe that the climate resilient PPPs are part of the solution and this is why I very much look forward to this masterclass. I think it's the perfect time to focus on this, especially post-COVID, when the use of PPPs you know, will, be, will be used to, to build back on infrastructure. And I believe that even this new phase, uh, climate resilient infrastructure should also be incorporated. Infrastructure development requires heavy investment that no one would like to lose due to the impact of climate change. In fact, PPP is a good way to mobilize the required budget. Therefore, this course is really a great opportunity to enhance climate resilient infrastructure through PPP projects. I would like to help governments, especially from developing countries, tap into these private financial resources, um, which can also then contribute towards the goals of the Paris Agreement. I'm interested in accelerating and scaling climate resilient infrastructure through PPP financing and project development, particularly in fragile state transition economies, emerging markets and developing countries' context. Climate resilience PPPs recognize the inherent nexus between climate and resilience in use with the stakeholder partnerships as a key strategy to support scaling up 
in scaling up. PPPs offer an excellent way to integrate climate resilience considerations into long-term infrastructure planning. Uh, they not only allow us to bridge the financing gap, but also leverage the strengths of all parties involved and also dis distribute the risk. The key challenges are the lack of knowledge on climate resilience among the representatives of public authorities, business and population, as well as absence of mechanisms for stimulating the implementation of PPP projects oriented on climate change. Many people do not have information or capacity on climate change, and hence this causes challenges in obtaining approvals and having decisions made in regard to developing these climate resilient infrastructure projects. Uh, one, the cost of incorporating climate resilience in PPP project designs and two, getting stakeholders to accept these cost elements as against those without such approach or designs. We know how to quantify the climate really impact, how much damage, how much impact it has, how much lives it costs. But we do not, and we are not able yet to monetize it. We cannot push a price tag to it and therefore uh, make it investable for investors. Absence of uh, comprehensive policy legal and streamlined institutional framework and set out clear procedures for doing so. Uh, secondly, uh, it will include the limited or inadequate capacity for project analysis, often leading to poor project designs and implementation. And thirdly, uh, it will include uh, lack of political. Even though there's a significant body of knowledge on climate change, this body of knowledge has not made its way into national PPP policies or implementation guidelines. So therein lies the gap. We have government organizations and practitioners wondering on how best to implement climate resilience into the projects, whether the integration will cause projects to be less attractive or more cumbersome. We have the bidding community perhaps asking the question of whether or not these climate requirements will force a higher bid, a less attractive bid, therefore reducing their chances of success if they score poorly on the financial portion of the public procurement. So we really need to address these gaps in knowledge and misconceptions in order to move forward successfully. It was great to hear the voices of practitioners that are working on PPP projects on the ground. Throughout the week of this masterclass, we will hear from 15 experts and discuss together the challenges and opportunities to integrate climate adaptation and resilience into infrastructure PPPs. The goal of this masterclass is to provide you with the tools and knowledge as well as exchange experiences to help you in addressing some of these challenges that you have raised. As climate resilient infrastructure officers, you create a network of practitioners keen to change the way infrastructure is planned, developed, financed, and maintained. Today, we start the program with a keynote lecture on the opportunity to leverage PPPs for climate resilient infrastructure. And before introducing you to our keynote speaker, I would like to introduce you to David Baxter, who will be the moderator of this masterclass. David is a senior PPP advisor at the International Sustainable Resilience Center and member of the steering committee of the World Association of PPP Units and Practitioners, WAP. David will be with us throughout the week of the masterclass and moderate all the main sessions. He brings over 30 years of experience in international development and PPP projects and has worked in Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, and North America. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela, for the introduction. I am, a, am very happy to be part of this major event. As we've heard from the previous speakers, we are at a situation in the world where, where this type of adaptation or resilience is no longer an option, but we are on a critical path where we really do need to consider every option that we can do to address the enormous um, infrastructure funding gap and also the consequences of not having resilient and adaptive, adaptive um, infrastructure. 
We are looking at the new generation of leaders. The participants in this workshop will have the pivotal role of being champions in the future. We're also looking at building a global community of practitioners, which includes practitioners from both the public and the private sector, as well as formal development institutions. Um, we need to look at the idea of addressing, addressing risk, and we'll have a lot of discussions on nature-based solutions, and we're at this pivotal moment where we have to address risk now. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome the keynote speaker of the opening of the masterclass, Stefan Halligata. Stefan is the lead economist from the World Bank Climate Change Group and has vast experience on the economic impacts on natural disasters to infrastructure, climate change, adaptation, amongst many other topics. He was the lead author of the fifth assessment report of the IPCC and the team leader from the World Bank Climate Change Action Plan. He is also the lead author of the report Lifelines, the Resilient Infrastructure Opportunity and Resilience Rating Systems, the latter which was a key source of the CGA's Climate Resilient Infrastructure Officer Handbook. I wish you all a, best, a good day today, and Stefan, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, and uh, and thanks uh, for the uh, opportunity to be with you this uh, this morning. I mean, at least for me, um, I think this is a very important topic, and um, the uh, the testimony of the participants I think were really really interesting, showing um, how the, the knowledge about this opportunity with resilient infrastructure uh, is is growing, and the action that is already uh, starting. So this is a very exciting time to talk about resilient uh, infrastructure. What I will try to do this morning um, is to uh, open this week um, with um, a little bit of framework about resilient infrastructure and a little bit of economics about the opportunity uh, that this could offer to us, um, and maybe a few ideas about the priorities for, for action. Um, so let me start um, by basically trying to define a little bit what we're talking about. Because you know, people have been using resilient uh, resilience as a term a lot, and as as you know, there are many different ways of looking at, at this issue. When we started to work on resilient infrastructure, uh, the first thing we did was really to look at those different definitions and try to explain um, what what definition would be most useful for us. And of course, the first definition you'll find is uh, to define the resilience of infrastructure speaking about the assets. So you're building a new road, like the one you see on the screen. Um, you want this road not to be washed away by a flood or damaged by uh, any other natural event. Uh, and in that case, the goal of resilience is really to make the asset less costly to maintain and, and repair. Uh, but this definition is, is very narrow and you can expand a little bit your scope and think about uh, the resilience of infrastructure services. Because after all, if, if the road is damaged, but there is another one going around and activities are not affected, uh, it might be not so much an issue if, if the roads uh, experience damages. What really matters is whether the system, your transport system, your water system, your energy system, that the system is able to deliver services to, um, to its clients and users. And of course, when you move from assets to the system, um, you open new opportunities to create resilience, and you create new opportunities to create resilience at a lower cost. Uh, so that's really where uh, the interest lies. But you can even expand the scope once more, and not to look only at the services, but to look at the users. Because same thing, if, if your infrastructure system is being disrupted, but all of your users can adapt to that and, and cope with it, and there is no impact on them, maybe it's okay. So this larger definition of resilient infrastructure, which is not only about the supply, but also about the users, about the demand for infrastructure services, um, is, is, is a more comprehensive framework to think about resilience. And like before, when you expand the scope, what you do is you open new opportunities. So maybe it's cheaper sometimes to make your users better able to cope with disruptions than trying to avoid all disruptions. So by expanding the scope, we were really trying to find all of the opportunities to build resilience at a low cost 
and to make resilience something that everybody can afford, even, even in, in, uh, in low income countries and environments. There's another rationale to expand the scope from assets to uh, systems and to users. Um, it's to move a little bit the discussion about uh, infrastructure resilience from a pure engineering question um, to something which is at the core of economic development and economic policy. Um, I don't know what your experience is, but when you talk about the resilience of infrastructure to decision makers, especially in the economic domain, um, very quickly people just assume that this is an engineering problem. This, this is not something that a Minister of Finance, a Minister of Economy should be, should be looking at. By talking about infrastructure resilience, not as a pure engineering and technical problem, but as a problem for the users, including those kids. This is Haiti when water supplies were all interrupted by the earthquake. Um, if you talk about the users, you make infrastructure resilience not a pure engineering problem, but also an economic and development problem, a problem about the well-being of the population. Uh, so it's really good practice to try to engage beyond the people who are already interested in, in resilience uh, to talk about users as much as we can and to frame those issues uh, in terms of the users. So it could be those kids, could be those people stuck in traffic trying to get to work in, in Thailand and being delayed uh, because of that. It can be people in their office without power, um, waiting for power to come back to, to get back to what they do. Resilience of infrastructure, if you're taking this user perspective, is a question of productivity, it's a question of competitiveness, it's a question of well-being, and it's not purely uh, an engineering technical issue. So I'll try to summarize our findings uh, from the Lifelines book. Uh, we had three parts. First, the diagnosis of the current situation, then a review of possible solutions, and then a few recommendations. Let me start with the diagnosis, which is the, the harm that the lack of resilience uh, in infrastructure is doing to people and firms. The first thing we did, very traditional analysis. We took an inventory of infrastructure assets in the world, we had about 60 million uh, assets in our data sets. And we looked at what are those assets exposed to? Earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and how much damages do we expect every year? Um, our estimate suggests about 30, million, 30 billion uh, dollar in annual losses uh, due to natural disasters on transport and power generation only. Uh, including 18 billion in low and middle income countries. Um, what you see in this map is a map of what is the main uh, threat to infrastructure. And as you can see, most of the threat is from floods in most of the world. But there are, of course, places where hurricanes are more of an issue China, the US uh, coastline, uh, and places where earthquakes dominate. So the, the first conclusion was this large reconstruction and repair costs that we expect every year and the diversity of situation across countries. But in fact, we're not so worried about those costs. And let me explain you why. The costs of repairs, we know about them. Uh, if you're the director of the road agency, you know that you have to pay to repair roads uh, after disasters. So these costs are highly visible and most likely they are taken into account. What people don't see and what people might not take into account are the cost of disruptions. Because if you're the director of the road agency, you see that sometimes you need to repair a road that has been damaged by a flood. You don't necessarily see that somebody could not get to the hospital because the road was interrupted, or like a very important delivery of a company was not made on time because the road was, was cut. All of those costs on users is really what we wanted to stress in that book. And Imad, in, in his introduction, already mentioned this estimate that in middle and low income countries, every year between, say, 400 and, and 700 billion dollars were lost. These costs are for firms. Um, so, for instance, because you have a production uh, system, you have a factory, but it cannot run because you don't have power. This, this loss of, of utilization of your production system is something that costs about 150 billion per year uh, in those countries. 
Also, there are things that you cannot sell. This is 80 billion additional. And there, there is about $65 billion that firms spend to, uh, for generators. So because the grid is not resilient, the people have to buy generators and, and fuel. Um, so those costs are already very big. And for firms, there are a lot of other costs that we know are there, but we cannot estimate globally. For instance, if you're in a country with a lot of power outages, you cannot use the latest production technologies uh, because those technologies are too dependent on reliable power. Uh, if you're a small firm being created in Africa, you need to spend $3,000 for a generator. This is a massive investment cost for a very small firm. And so there is a lot of jobs that never get created, a lot of firms that never get created because uh, of these additional costs. So those numbers for firms are big, but they are like an underestimate. Same thing for households. Um, we looked at the willingness to pay for better electricity, water, and so on. Uh, but we know that we underestimate the impact of the lack of, of, uh, of resilience in infrastructure. One example, we know that the lack of resilience in infrastructure affects gender equality. Because in many countries, women are in charge of, um, of cooking and bringing water. So when there is no water or there is no power, they are the ones uh, who have to deal with the issue. We cannot quantify and monetize the impact on gender uh, equality, but we know it's really important. So see this number as just a big flag that there are big impacts on users, uh, but keep in mind that this is understood. These costs are for all disruptions, uh, but of course not all disruptions are due to natural disasters. Uh, we did a few deep dives in a few countries. This is for Tanzania, as an example. Um, where about 50% of the disruptions in infrastructure systems uh, for transport and, and energy are uh, due to heavy rainfall and, and floods. Uh, so it's, it's close to 1% of GDP that Tanzania is losing every year because infrastructure are not resilient enough. So again, a big potential to do better. So this was the diagnosis. We're losing a lot. Of, of money because our infrastructure are not resilient enough. A little bit of this cost is because we have to repair them too often. A big part of the cost is because uh, users get affected. So what can we do about it? Here, I'll use my, my, my framing with assets, services, and users. So let me start with assets. And don't look too much at this slide. It's just an illustration. We, we worked with the Miyamoto International um, um, a Global uh, Engineering Firms uh, identifying about 70 different options, technical options, to make infrastructure more resilient. And for all of those options, we looked at how much they cost and how much they reduce risks. And um, our, our conclusion was that for a lot of, of cases, we have already options available to make infrastructure more resilient. Those options are regularly implemented in the Netherlands, in California, in Japan, but not in most of the world, and they are available. We, we know about them and there is no uh, complex issues that just need to be implemented. But then we all looked not only at the assets, but we moved to the system. And this is where I think a lot of the potential uh, lies. So compare here, Belgium and Madagascar. Uh, when you're losing a road in Belgium, most of the case you can just drive around. In Madagascar, when you're losing a road, you might have a big part of the country that cannot be reached. So we did this estimating in all of the countries. This is what you see on the right. On the x-axis, you see how the fraction of the roads you're losing. And in the y-axis, you see the fraction of the transport service in your country that you're losing. So in Belgium, if you lose 10% of your roads, you're losing 2-3% of the capacity of the transport system to move people and goods. In Madagascar, if you lose 10% of the roads, you're losing about 70% of transport capacity in your country. It means that looking at each of the road individually is not enough. If you're working in Madagascar, you have to take into account that each of your roads is really important because there is no redundancy. And only by looking not only at each asset individually, but, but looking at your system as a whole, you can do the right economic analysis and, and decide if you want to invest more in the road to make it more, more resilient. And of course, 
moving from assets to system, you want to talk about redundancy and, and that type of options, then you can take one more step and, and look at who is using your infrastructure. Um, so here, this is a piece of work we did in, in Tanzania. Uh, we looked at uh, the roads and the, the bridges in the country, looking at which roads, which bridges are the most important, but not in absolute, for different users. On the left, you see what's most important for consumers. And you see, for instance, like this coastal road south of Dar es Salaam is really important for, uh, for household consumption, especially for food security. If you look on the right, you see the importance of roads and, and bridges for, for uh, international trade. And of course, here you see that this road south of Dar es Salaam is much less important, but the border road with Zambia is really important because that's where a lot of goods are going from the port of Dar es Salaam to, um, to uh, a lot of landlocked countries. So here, what we wanted to do is first provide the government with priorities, what if, if you have a little bit of money to invest in resilience, where should this be? Uh, so if you're doing PVPs, what level of resilience are you asking in different places in the country? But also to be able to link that to the uh, who is using those infrastructures so that we better understand who would benefit um, from, from those investments. Um, in the book, and I don't have time to go very much to the details, but we look at special cases for critical services. So of course, hospitals cannot be treated like everything else. Uh, what you can do with your business, uh, working to make sure they are prepared. And of course, uh, making sure your households, families in the countries are prepared because if, if everybody has three days of, of water at home, uh, it makes the consequences of water uh, disruptions, for instance, much more manageable. And we looked at things like access to healthcare. Uh, this is a, a map of, of Kampala showing that during floods, uh, all of the north of the city is losing access to healthcare. Um, so again, this is an important um, thing to consider if you're thinking about which bridge you will reinforce, but also uh, I think we're thinking a lot about PPPs and infrastructure in terms of, of water and energy and sound. But if you're building a new hospital in Kampala, uh, probably the north of the city is a good idea because this is the place that doesn't have access to healthcare during during floods. So again, another example of cases where looking at who is using infrastructure is as important as looking at the infrastructure themselves. Uh, in in the book, we we did an economic analysis to show the value of investing in more resilient infrastructure, and we did two things. First, we looked at how much it would cost to build all new infrastructure assets in more resilient. And this is the blue bars you see here for power, transport, and, and water and sanitation. If you try to build everything stronger, it's very expensive in the hundreds of billion uh, dollars per year in low and middle income countries. But if you can target interventions, uh, so you basically strengthen the assets which are exposed to risk and the ones that are most important, then you can reduce that cost very much. And we showed that you can make infrastructure systems more resilient for between 10 and 65 billion per year. It's only 3% more than the, the, the cost of uh, quote unquote normal investments. So basically for 3% more, you buy much more resilience in your infrastructure systems. And what would be the benefits? Well, the benefits would be $4 every time you invest $1. And the total potential is about $4 trillion. So there is a lot of opportunity here to capture a lot of economic benefits by investing 3% more in infrastructure to make them resilient. And we also showed that this is something that should be done with no delay. Uh, there is so much infrastructure being built every year uh, these days that every time we delay by a year, uh, we're losing $100 billion. So this, this gives a good sense of the, uh, of the urgency. Let me finish with, with the recommendations uh, that we present in the book. Um, the first thing we, we, we want to stress is that the big challenge is not so much spending more, and everybody's talking about the need to spend more, but the big challenge is to spend better. 
And this is just an illustration of this fact. This is the performance of transport system as a function of how much countries are spending on them. And you see countries spending more tends to have a better performance until you control for governance. So what this figure shows is that if you don't improve governance of, and when I say governance, it means decision-making to make sure what we build is well-built. Spending more is not very useful. The big lesson from this book was really that it's not about spending more. It's about improving how we spend, how we design infrastructure, how we implement our projects. And it means that in the, all of those costs of infrastructure systems, so there are costs to regulators and governments, like master planning, data and models, training, and so on. And there are costs for operators and providers, like project design and preparation, investment costs, and the operation and, and maintenance costs. In all of these costs, we often talk quite a lot about investment costs, because this is where the big money is. What we say in the book is the investments that will bring the most resilience are investments in better master planning, better regulation design and enforcement, but also better project preparation and design. And also, more in the downstream segments, better maintenance. Um, and we show in the book that every time we invest $1 in maintenance, uh, we avoid uh, to have to spend $1.5 in new investments. So maintenance is also a very, uh, a very good deal. So the, 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 the challenge here is to move the discussion from a focus on investment costs and spending more to get better infrastructure into spending more money upfront, in better designing of projects and better planning uh, and maintaining those infrastructure. And of course, this is a, this is a big challenge because um, in, if, you, if you look at a typical uh, investment project in infrastructure, um, when we do the very early stage design and preparation, we don't have a lot of resources available to pay for a risk assessment. So what happens is at the very early stage, we don't have half a million dollars to do a risk assessment, so we don't do it and you design the project without looking at risks. And when you move to construction, the cost is in the billions. So you have resources to do the risk assessment. But at that stage, a lot of the strategic decisions have been made already. Uh, for instance, the localization of the project has been decided. So at this stage, it's too late to do the smart thing, which is to relocate or like to adjust the, the, the technology. And all you can do is, is to strengthen, which is extremely costly. So our case here is that if we think about risk earlier in the project design, you'll be able, we will be able to do resilience smartly, and doing it smartly is really cheap. Uh, if you look at resilience when you're well advanced in project design, all of the strategic decisions have been made already, and the only way to do resilience is to do strengthening, which is really expensive. So really the key in doing cheap resilience is in thinking about it upstream in the process. Since this is about PVPs, I, I wanted to conclude um, with the, the, the a discussion on the appropriate regulations and incentives uh, for, for, for PPPs. Uh, in the book, we, we, we propose a, a framework to think about, about those issues uh, in terms of a few uh, steps. So the first thing is to think of resilience as resilience against what? And you have very frequent uh, shocks, like you know the small floods that affect cities all the time. And you have the major, very big disasters. Think the earthquake in Japan in 2011. The first thing to define for a regulator is the level of risk, which we call intolerable. So you cannot accept that your road system, your energy system, your water system get disrupted every time there is a small flood. So for, for that risk, which is unacceptable, uh, there is really the need to define that limit in quantified term so that it's very uh, clear to investors and project designers that there are some risks that cannot be tolerated. 
for the very, very big events, again, think of the big earthquake. Uh, of course, we, we have to accept that there are some damages for these very big disasters. And that's typically what we, what we call the, the, um, the, the force measure flows in a PPP. But if you look at force measure clauses in PPPs, very often they are very qualitative. Uh, it, it's about if a big disaster happens. Uh, what we recommend is to have a quantified metric of what is too intense uh, to, to expect uh, infrastructure to resist and have that in the contract in, in, a, in a quantified manner with a third party uh, in charge of, of telling you if the, when something happens, if it was part of the force measure or not. And of course, the question is, in between those risks that you cannot accept and those risks that you have to accept because they are so big, uh, you need to define your contract in a way that shares the risk between the, in, the investor and the public sector. Uh, but you have to do it in a way that the investor always keeps part of the risk uh, because you want to keep the um, you want to keep the incentives for the project developers and the investors to invest in resilient projects. So we have really these three steps. What is acceptable? It's a regulation. What is what has to be accepted? This is force measure. And in between, how do you share the risks between the different stakeholders to keep an incentive for everybody to manage risks? And this is the way to ensure that those projects will be developed uh, in, in, um, in a resilient way. To support this, um, we, we, we have been investing in, in what we call the resilience rating system. Uh, you'll have a presentation about that in this, uh, in this week, so I won't uh, talk about it too much. But this is a way to make sure investors, when they make a decision to go ahead with a project or not, know what they're buying. And that to make sure they are informed about the level of resilience of the projects they are investing in, uh, so that we can ensure that the right decisions are made. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, I just want to uh, thank the, the many authors that contributed to this uh, work on infrastructure resilience, uh, including the government of Japan who supported this work. Um, I want to thank again the organizers for giving um, me the opportunity to present this work as an introduction to your week. Um, I'm very excited to, uh, to see this new program being set up. Uh, as I said, we'll be participating over the, 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 the week uh, with, with different trainings. And um, I wish you on, on, on behalf of, uh, of all of the team a very successful week. And of course, we remain available should you have any comments, feedback, questions on, on this work. Have a very good week and thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for your feedback. Um, we appreciate the um, presentation you made and I think some really critical questions were asked. Um, I, um, we are going to um, basically open the floor in a few minutes to the workshop participants where they'll have a chance to ask questions. I would appreciate that when the participants want to ask questions, if they use the chat box function, this is really important so that um, we can ensure that um, your voices are heard and the opportunities are given. Please keep your questions to questions and not statements so that I can answer them or direct them to the correct people to answer them pretty quickly. Stefan, I just have one question for you as we move forward. Um, you know, you talked about, you know, costs, additional costs, you know, investing in upfront in the project and that. I've worked in many countries where the situation often arises that as soon as you start talking about climate resilience, planning, design, you start talking about adaptation, then these countries or um, public sector entities in these countries will say that, you know, this is a great idea, et cetera, but we cannot afford it. Um, I was wondering if you could just, you know, give some comments in that regard. You know, are we at the point where we can't use that argument anymore? Do you know, do we have to talk about long term? Um, I'll throw the floor open to you if you can just, you know, maybe respond to that question. Yeah, no, of, of course, this is this is a, a, a big question and, and this is a question very relevant for this week in the sense that it's, it's a constraint on how much we can invest because you can make very easily the case that the long term cost of resilience is negative. I mean, if, 
when we when we recommend more resilience, it's because over the long run, it saves money. It saves money on maintenance, it saves money on repairs, and it saves money because it makes your economy uh, more competitive and more productive. The challenge is when people say we cannot afford it, it's the investment capacity. And so convincing also private investors that it's in their own interests to put a little bit more ex ante because it will get them higher returns is really a critical part of the equation. And if we're working on the residence rating system, it's because we felt that a lot of investors would be ready to spend more on residence to have higher returns. And one of the constraints is they don't know which projects are resilient and which projects are not. Uh, and if they don't have this information, they cannot take it into account. They cannot prioritize uh, the most resilient projects. And also, they cannot offer better terms to more resilient projects. So if we improve the access to information, if investors are aware that maybe this project is a little bit more expensive, but it's because it's more resilient and therefore must more likely to deliver high returns, then it also changed the discussion between investors and project developers. And hopefully this, this issue that we cannot afford it can be, can be managed. And this is just money on the table that needs to be taken. I mean, it, it's there. Uh, so the question is, how do we improve our decision making, our governance of infrastructure systems, our PPP frameworks, uh, so that we can capture those, uh, those opportunities? But this constraint is very real. It's an everyday, it's an everyday challenge. And, and that's why it, this, this week is so important, because we need to take resilience and to put it at the core of the discussion on infrastructure design and, and, and PPP frameworks. Thank you. I've put out a call for everyone to ask questions if you have. Um, the chat box is still empty. So while we're waiting for another one, um, Stefan, I'd just like to um, just ask another question. Um, PDP teams are very diverse and have different um, practice backgrounds and different experts. And so you'll know you'll have policy um, experts, you'll have engineering experts, you'll have, you know, um, socioeconomic, environmental, each which are we each which has their own sort of approach. They each has their own understanding and their perspective on you know climate change, climate adaptation, how it can be adopted. Um, do you have any words of advice on how we can get the different um, you know background experts to talk better to one another, to communicate with one another, so that um, we. Um, can encourage this communication, which is so important during the, the visioning, the planning, et cetera, because often we talk past one another, we don't talk with one another or to one another. And we find it, especially when they're multiple stakeholders, we find it very difficult to develop a common approach. Yeah, I don't have a, a, a miracle solution for that, but I can um, reflect on the experience within the, the World Bank, where we, we we are developing projects and we have those teams with people with different uh, types of trainings, different interests, different responsibilities. And what we found really useful to get this conversation going across teams are those very early stage, relatively simple uh, tools to start looking at resilience. So very early in the project, when you, you're at the stage where you frame your problem and you decide if, if what type of technologies you'll be, losing, you'll be looking at, what type of, of solutions, uh, we have this risk screening tool, for instance, which is asking teams about the different threats to the success of the project. Is that flood? Is that high temperatures? Is that earthquakes? And then... It, you have like a few guiding questions that the team has to discuss. And by how these questions are framed, you have to have a multidisciplinary team to answer to them. Because some questions are about the design, some questions are about the economics, some questions are about the financing. And with this very early discussion and those guiding questions, you kind of like force the different parts of the teams to start very early discussing about those issues. And, and what we really are trying to achieve, it's exactly what you suggest, is to make sure the, the engineer uh, part of the discussion about the different options and so on get discussed with the economics so that people can understand what it does on upfront investment, but also on long-term costs, but also in, in relationship with the financing 
in relationship with the legal aspect of, of how do we separate risks. And, and there is no way to make that happen. It has to happen at the very early stage of the project. And you have to rely on relatively simple tools. So it's better to do some quick and dirty back on the envelope calculation early in the project design so that everybody can discuss those issues rather than waiting that you have the budget to do the super sophisticated analysis. So my advice to all of the teams is to have these early sessions where you look at the resilient aspect of the project without trying to do sophisticated things, but just trying to explore the threats and the options and how they relate to each other. Thank you. We're getting some questions that are appearing now from the attendees. America Bendito asks this question. Um, he says, thanks to the presentation, he says, resilient infra infrastructure is not possible if we don't improve infrastructure codes. And I would assume this is also to do with standards. Um, is this included in the report? Do you have comments in that regard? Um, yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a topic we, we cover um, with, with a few aspects. I mean, the, the first one is um, that the discussion of, of standards and codes cannot be disconnected from the question of enforcement uh, and, and capacity of the people building the assets. So you have countries uh, with very ambitious standards and codes that just don't get implemented. And sometimes this disconnect between the standards that are in the books and the standards that can realistically be applied is so large that enforcement is impossible just because codes are too ambitious. So the first thing is, it's not only about the code, it's really this, this ecosystem, including capacity of the construction industry, enforcement capacity, and the codes that needs to be looked at together. And then we highlight two issues. One is many low-income countries have codes which are uh, basically codes from richer countries that have been just adapted, and they might not be uh, the right ones. Uh, we have a few examples where, where codes are just not even including the, 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 the ways many of the infrastructure in the country are being designed. And there is a second issue, which is that very often infrastructure codes and standards are, are outdated, uh, and especially in the context of rapidly changing uh, risks. And so you have climate change affecting the risks, but there are also many other things, right? There's urbanization, there is like land use changes, so risks are changing over time. And very often the, the standards that we have don't take into account this, this change in risks. They assume that the risks are stable, which is really not the case. So we discussed that and we, we show a few examples of countries which have started to uh, update their codes and put in place some regulations that codes get updated every five years. I think the Netherlands is a good example of, of that. Um, so we, we, we offer also ideas about, about solutions for that. Thank you. Um, Delfina Lopez Fajardo has a question. It says, what, what have been the main financial challenges to addressing maintenance? And I would gather this is the maintenance of projects and, you know, from an aspect of resilience and adaptation. Um, any ideas or thoughts you could share with us? Yeah, so this is also something that we've been working on quite a lot and the the and there are different obstacles one one obstacle is is a pure like data one uh, so we have been investing quite a lot in uh, asset inventories uh, so that um, agencies and governments know what what are the assets in the country what is their status and condition so that you can start to prioritize and start maintaining uh, in a more like proactive way instead of just running after the last thing that broke and have a pure like a uh, repair approach to, to maintenance. Uh, and so we, we again, we, we offer solutions going from the very simple solution where you just have a list of your assets to much more sophisticated systems where uh, you kind of track in real time your assets and, and, and you can plan the maintenance in a much more proactive way. So that's one, one obstacle. Like in some countries, you, you don't, even know where your assets are located. So it's very difficult to maintain them properly. Uh, a second uh, problem, which is uh, more like a combination of financial and political, is that every time there, there is a budget cut, uh, maintenance is always the thing that gets cut. Uh, and, and that's for many reasons. Uh, the fact that it's true that sometimes you can delay maintenance, but not too much. But I think this is a, kind of like overused. 
And also the fact that delaying maintenance is much less visible than canceling new investments. So very often people prefer uh, to cancel uh, maintenance. Disregarding first the effect on the system, but also disregarding um, the, all of the co-benefits of maintaining the system well, like the fact that you will reduce the need for long-term investments. And something that we have um, published recently uh, in the context of the uh, Italian G20 is the, the, the job content of maintenance is much, much higher than the job content of new investments. So we flag the fact that in a situation of economic crisis, where a government wants to spend money to create jobs, uh, looking at the maintenance backlog and investing in maintenance is a very good way to create jobs that may be needed at one point and to improve the condition of the infrastructure system and to reduce long-term costs. So it's like triple win that we're all after uh, maintenance is, is a really good one. And we, we will crack that nut when people realize that maintenance is not sort of like this secondary issue compared with investment costs. If you're looking at the international publications, you see everybody talking about investment needs and so few papers and reports on maintenance financing needs. Uh, I think this really has to change. Uh, every time we're talking about investment needs, we need to also talk about maintenance needs. And when countries invest more, we need to make sure they have also the capacity to maintain more. Because if you invest more and you cannot maintain more, you just you'll just invest and lose the, the benefits from your investments. So this is, I think, a very important battle to win. Thank you, Stefan. We have two more questions before we need to wrap up. Um, another question is, is the local community part of the initial, you know, initialization, visioning, planning of the project? So in essence, you know, this is from America Bendito again, what type of role does the local community play in this whole strategy and this whole approach? So this is this is the one of the major benefits of thinking in terms not not only of supply but also in terms of the users. Uh, if you think of resilience as resilience at the end of your users, then you bring your users at the core of the discussion, and you will not only try to make your infrastructure system more robust, but you will also engage with the users, saying, "Okay, what is making your life more difficult?" And if I have one minute, I have a fantastic example for that. It's in a, in a small island where uh, they, the island had like bridges around the island that it's the only road. Um, and when a hurricane uh, um, hit, those bridges were destroyed and it took months uh, before they could be, uh, be back online. But before repairing, um, I think it was AFD, the French Development Agency, they, they run a survey with the, with, with the farmers using those bridges. And what the farmers said is, we don't care so much if the bridge are damaged, if it's not more than two weeks. Because if it's more than two weeks, then we're starting to lose production and so on. And the decision was, instead of repairing the bridge with new bridges that can be destroyed and it takes more than two weeks to repair them, uh, to basically have have passes which are closed a few days per, per year, but never more than two weeks and cannot be destroyed for more than two weeks. So basically because of this discussion, this engagement with users, the technological solution was radically changed away from something that tries to be available 24 seven to something that is sometimes disrupted, but never more than three days. Because the, the big challenge is not to have long disruptions, not to have no disruptions at all. I think it's a very good example of cases where only by bringing the users, you can really understand what the problem is and therefore what the solution might be. And last question from the floor. Ricardo Munro has a question, and I'll just paraphrase. Basically, it's you know due to the concept of systems resilience conflict with some traditional terms and some PPP agreements. Um, you know, we have you know fixed structures, we have fixed approaches, et cetera, set out in the contract. You know, how can you, do you have to compensate partners if you have to introduce um, adaptation or resilience post the agreement? Or, you know, where is it best you build it in front? Um, I'll leave that to you to give us some sort of insights in that regard. So and my take on that is that we have the existing, right? We have a legacy of probably not doing the right thing. The first priority is to get it right in the new things. 
so I, I, it's, it's true that we have some contracts in the past that were not designed thinking about resilience and, and maybe there are some compensation if you change the rules of the game at the middle of the contract, but that's, I think that makes sense. Uh, the, the big priority is to make sure like the new contracts take, take this resilience dimension into account. And I, I want to say that one of the hope that I think we have is bringing this resilience angle and this climate change adaptation angle into the discussion would get benefits beyond resilience and climate change adaptation in the sense that uh, climate is not the only change, the only uncertainty those projects have to deal with. Uh, there, there are uncertainties in the demand, in the future technologies, and so on. And having more flexibility in dealing with those changes and have project and have like legal agreements and contracts that can more easily be adapted and adjusted to different contexts in a way that is agreed ex ante, I think would be beneficial for PPPs in general be, beyond that resilience and adaptation. Uh, so by bringing this question, I think we should not feel restricted to talk only about threats coming from climate. We should feel free to talk about the threats coming from changing conditions, including technologies and socioeconomic drivers. Uh, and help design projects that are more robust and resilient to changes and to surprises in general, and not only uh, weather and climate related ones. Thank you, Stefan. We appreciate your um, feedback and the questions. This is where we often, you know, get the chance to get answers to some of the things that kind of, you know, are burning in the back of our minds and we're not always finding the solutions for them. I was just wondering if you could just, in a matter of just two minutes, give us, you know, sort of a brief summary, you know, full of, uh, of last few golden nuggets or comments that you could share with the audience so that they can understand as they adapt and look at resilience and they look at how they can implement this, you know, just some things that you would stress again, which are really important as they move forward with this whole new approach to introducing climate resilience to PPPs, just in your closing comments. So and as a closing, I think the the challenge for, for people working in that field is the big challenge is not to present what we're doing as an end goal. Um, I think we're, we're not trying to improve resilience because we like resilience. We're not trying to adapt infrastructure systems because it's, it's our title to work on adaptation to climate change. Uh, we have to always frame those uh, objectives in the context of bigger development objectives. Uh, universal access to energy, universal access to water and sanitation, more productive and competitive cities and more livable cities. The, those are the real end goals. Resilience is a way to get there. Uh, and I think very often we, 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 we talk past each other uh, because we, we take our objective of resilience and adaptation as the final objective and this doesn't resonate with a lot of people working in different agencies and, and, and different ministries. Uh, if we make the effort of systematically framing resilience and adaptation as a way to achieve the objectives of the people we are talking with, uh, we're much more likely to make them understand that we're here to help them. And we're not like the painful guys bringing the resilience and the risk issues all the time. We're, we're here to help them have good projects that perform as expected that delivers development benefits and financial results. Uh, and if, if we do that, we're much more likely to, to have this constructive discussion with the different stakeholders in the project team uh, and much more likely to be successful at the end. Thank you very much. Um, just some observations from this session. First of all, I would really like to thank Stefan, also Imad from the World Bank, for their insights and comments that they provided. It's very gratifying that to see that as we move forward with this incredibly important initiative, that there are so many institutions globally that are supporting this initiative. You know, without the thought leadership shown by the World Bank, shown by other organizations that will be represented, you know, over the next few days, there's not going to be much progress made. Um, collaboration is important, sharing ideas is important. And leveraging each other's um, experiences and opportunities is incredibly important. Um, I, 
was interested when I looked at the participants list to see that they are participants who will be um, taking part in this workshop, both from the private and, um, and the public sectors. And I think this is critically important because as was mentioned by um, Imad, for example, you know, public-private partnerships are partnerships between the public and the private sector. It's not just one or the other. And because of this, it's critically important that you know, we build on these partnerships when we look at resilience as well as adaptation. Later on the week, I'm going to be talking a bit about stakeholders, but it was also very gratifying to me in the handbook to see that there's tremendous reference made to stakeholders. I did a count of the times that stakeholders are mentioned in the document, and it's over 70 times. So this is a, an important stress. You know, We can't do this on our own. We have to do this together. A um, number of speakers also stress some really important things, and I just want to recap them, that you know PPPs are difficult to implement, but they can be done. They have to be adapted. They have to be resilient. You know, we have to look at things like force majeure, you know, the unknown, the known, we have to prepare. Um, a person once said to me, you know, when we plan for disasters, we don't plan for the best case scenario. We try and plan for the worst case scenario, and I think this is... Um, something that we should also build into, you know, resilience when we look at it. Um, uh, Jay Young also said something that really resonated with me, and that was that, you know, climate resilience or climate resilience best practices in PPVs are no longer an option. You know, just in the United States where I live, if you just look at some of the cat catastrophes that we've had in the last few months that have been major thought changes, the big fires in California, which have destroyed infrastructure and a direct result of climate change. In what happened in Texas in the winter with extreme winter conditions that essentially brought down the whole um, power grid. And then just recently what happened in New Orleans, you know, here we have an American state where people least would expect it, but the hurricane resulted in the first few days for almost a week, one million people without power you know, one just doesn't expect this, and these things are happening. And then even in Europe, with the massive flooding that took place in Germany, and I remember a lady on CNN saying, we were so shocked, this doesn't happen in Europe. Well, the reality is this type of thing now is happening wherever we live and wherever we are. Um, the other thing that was also important, you know, we do need to identify strong leaders that are going to move this forward. And I would admonish the workshop participants that once you have finished, with this workshop this week, that you become those beacons of hope, that lighthouse that broadcasts the messages, that this can be done, that you become leaders. Um, we are looking at forming a global community of practitioners. This workshop will be repeated. The certification program will introduce people over and over to new ideas. So let's move forward, let's work together. We need to realize that it's a holistic approach from policy to practice, from lawyers to engineers. They don't always agree. They don't always talk the same language, but this workshop will offer that opportunity. And we cannot say that we cannot afford it. We have no choice. And then as we move forward, you know, we will look at new technologies, new, appraise, new approaches, but we are on the forefront of changing the way the world thinks, the way the world approaches everything. And those are my closing comments. I'd like to hand over back to GCA for their closing comments. Thank you, David. And also thank you, Stefan, for this great presentation. Uh, now we are back here at the Studio of the floating office in Rotterdam. And I hope that this introduction to the masterclass uh, made you rethink the way you are going to, to plan, develop, and implement resilient infrastructure in the future. I hope this was just the start of uh, an insightful week and that in the next presentations of the masterclass, uh, you will further discuss ideas, challenges, and opportunities to transform the way you uh, develop infrastructure and re specifically resilient infrastructure, PPPs, in your own context. So thank you again, Stefan, for this great presentation, David, for your moderation, and to all the participants of the masterclass for such an engaging discussion. Thank you also to everyone that is watching the session live. All the sessions uh, throughout the week of the masterclass will be recorded and available at GCA's website, so you will not miss anything. With that, I would like to conclude the opening ceremony of GCA's masterclass on climate resilient PPPs. And before I do that, I would like to actually just take a picture with all 
the practitioners that will become the climate resilient infrastructure officers. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>